Yes. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, great. All right, sorry about that. So, uh, as I said earlier, um, this is a summary of some of my postdoctoral work at the University of Pittsburgh, which was focused on starting with cardiac MRIs of um, uh, of a certain acquisition called Sine Steady State Free Precession, um, and using the shape of the left ventricular endocardium to come up with some inferences that might be able to separate a set of asymptomatic. Uh, patients uh, from a set of patients who had ischemic heart disease and exhibited wall motion abnormalities. Uh, so we used novel metrics from the shape-derived uh, analysis of the motion of the heart to classify patients using Bayesian rule learning. So what is ischemic heart disease? Just a quick uh, primer. Uh, so ischemic heart disease is um, another word for coronary heart artery disease or coronary heart disease, and it accounts for one in three deaths in the United States. Um, the, I mean, it presents um, in terms of chest pain and shortness of breath and exertion, uh, and generally today it is identified in, in the clinic using um, anatomical evidence of a, uh, a stenosis in a coronary artery or functional evidence, uh, which is in terms of either myocardial perfusion uh, that means blood flow to the myocardium, um, as visualized with first pass perfusion cardiac MRI or nuclear spec, but also in terms of wall motion abnormalities. Now, each of these tests have different spectra of um, applicability, uh, and we'll get into that. But essentially, um, the gold standard is to use the catheterization. Uh, if, uh, for those of you who attended uh, Professor Charles Taylor's talk yesterday, uh, essentially now there's a way of doing fractional flow reserve through his company, heart flow in a non-invasive way using CT data. But um, it's not in the clinic yet, but, and so, you know, uh, fractional flow reserve using cardiac catheterization is really the gold standard today. So if there were a way to actually identify uh, ischemic heart disease at an earlier stage, it would be through either perfusion imaging or wall motion-based analysis of the heart. And uh, early detection is important because these ischemic heart disease patients progress to have heart failure. And uh, heart failure implies that, you know, not only uh, do the uh, affected territories of poor perfusion get ad ad experience something called adverse remodeling, but they experience dyskinetic motion as evidenced by this uh, uh, analysis that I prepared for another study actually, but which nicely highlights uh, the dyskinetic territory of a remodeled heart. And uh, from there on, surgical treatments are um, limited and um, so you want to identify these patients as early as possible. Now, this is also an, uh, this is, this is an interesting slide I found, um, but essentially coronary artery disease is, amounts to a huge annual expenditure in the United States. The annual spend of heart disease alone, uh, you know, expected to approach like 800 plus billion dollars in, uh, in, in, in another 20 years. And so uh, using imaging based metrics to truncate costs of expensive ex uh, and, you know, potentially risky invasive exams is of value, and that's where all of this is coming from. So reducing costs with imaging-based early detection of functional abnormalities might reduce that huge cost going towards these primarily diagnostic invasive tests and uh, 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 in regard to coronary heart disease. And then this might help with timely intervention and therefore reduce downstream costs in terms of affected patients with stroke and heart failure. So less, uh, using MRI is less toxic more diagnostic and hopefully will lower costs. Primary motivation of my uh, endeavors here. So remember we talked about um, the usefulness of different techniques being uh, in a spectrum. Well, if ischemic myo uh, myocardium were to be detected and you know, it was, you know very abstractly represented by this blob over there, uh, you know, myocardial perfusion imaging can detect that ischemic myocardium to the greatest possible extent. Uh, catheterization is good, but um, but if you look at the wall motion um, base evidence, it kind of works only when there's high scar burdens, which makes sense, right? I mean, if there's high extents of poor myocardial perfusion, then you would it would translate into a wall motion abnormality. Correct, but um, angiography detects a wide wide range of ischemic burdens. But um, 
you know, referring back again to Charles Taylor's talk, it kind of uh, fails 41% of the time uh, sometimes because 41% uh, of patients in reported studies who've had diagnostic catheterizations don't have coronary artery disease. So maybe imaging can tell us something more, but the hypothesis of this talk is that we can improve the accuracy of quantifying wall motion abnormalities using physics-based uh, interpretation, so to speak, of displacement uh, as observed from MRI, and then hopefully widen the spectrum of applicability of wall motion to detecting ischemic cardiomyopathy. All right. So in order to do this, we needed some patient data of cardiac MRIs, SINACE, uh, SSFP cardiac MRIs, and so um, we had access to the MESA and determined databases through cardiacatalyst.org, which is a repository of the uh, image data uh, of uh, these these cohort large cohort studies, which include thousands of patients. We sampled, just, just for the purpose of the study, we sampled 15 uh, patients from the MESA cohort and 40 patients from the determined cohort. Now, the MESA cohort it represents a, pa a subset of patients who are asymptomatic. That means they don't have any presented uh, signs of heart disease, no chest pain, no shortness of breath under stress. But determined cohort patients had one or more of those symptoms and may, have, may or may not have also had a myocardial infarction. So, so we start with their image data, which uh, was in the short axis, okay, short axis cardi uh, of the heart, acquired over several slices from base to apex of the heart. Um, reconstitute a three-dimensional model of the left ventricular endocardium at every single stage of the, um, every single phase of the cardi cardiac cycle. Analyze uh, the motion of the heart in terms of a shape uh, based metric, uh, which, you'll, which we'll be going into very shortly, and then Using that information, along with the standard metrics that the shapes tell you by themselves, namely volume and ejection fractions, uh, in order to train a Bayesian, come up with a set of rules uh, from a Bayesian ruling type uh, infrastructure for classification, which might help classify uh, a new patient, let's say, and then you know deliver some kind of unparalleled clinical value from the image data that. Uh, you know, this, this is the hope, right? So this is the workflow for um, this particular uh, endeavor. So the image data was steady state pre-session cardiac MRI, which looks like this. It, it, when these stacks are reoriented um, and reconstructed, you know, you can extract a, um, you know, shape for the left ventricle endocardium and essentially um, the uh, segmentation code uh, was one that's implemented within uh, Medviso segment, um, which was altered very slightly to uh, actually in improve the accuracy by which the um, active contours hugged onto the endocardium walls using the interaction forces. Uh, it essentially implements um, an algorithm for deformable models, uh, which hugs, to, hugs the edges of the endocardium, which you can see very clearly uh, in the um, short axis images in every slice. Then we stitch together those slices, segmentations, and come up with like 80 points per, seg uh, per slice level, and then n number of slices of a certain thickness, which is given by the DICOM header. Um, so now once this image data is uh, segmented, now this image data is then uh, analyzed for shape. But the interesting thing here is that every segmentation is independent of each other, right? I mean, each uh, time instant it represents an image volume, and then there's another image volume and another, and so the surfaces themselves don't have uh, inherent point correspondence. So we have to establish that point. Whoops. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> so we have to inherently establish that point correspondence, and in order to do that, uh, we have, um, we can use uh, one or more methods, uh, you know, some of the methods that have come up in uh, the SBIE meeting so far are spectral shape analysis methods, which by far are probably the best, uh, in my opinion, which will actually tell you how a shape moves irrespective of uh, isom uh, isometry, I mean, orientation. Then there's uh, spherical harmonic based methods, which express uh, a shape in a parametric form, and then you can compare them. Uh, again, uh, which probably will help you identify shapes that have moved in a different orientation. But in the case of uh, cine uh, cardiac MRI, each segmentation is essentially co-registered because 
uh, you have different uh, phases of contraction of the heart, but from uh, in the same orientation, and the heart isn't really moving, except for uh, with respect to its own axis. And so we could we employed a regional distance metric uh, and coded that in into a paraview uh, environment so that we could visualize it all, and. Um, and, and essentially, uh, we use a signed a, 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 a house drop distance to analyze the regional movement of the sh shape, uh, discretizing the surface into the number of points that each uh, slice was segmented into. Now, this signed distance implies that you know if it was moving inwards, we had a pos uh, we had a certain sign in this example. Um, I think we used negative for outwards and positive for inward motion. Um, as the sign convention for this distance metric. And then um, this inherently established point correspondences between consecutive phases, and then in, in a chain, it forms point correspondences throughout the uh, cardiac cycle. And therefore, we can characterize this fingerprint of phase-to-phase -phase displacement of the heart, right? And uh, we call that phase-to-phase -phase displacement of P2PD. Now, uh, essentially, uh, in order to like see if this uh, metric makes sense. We actually happened to have access to a pig model who had a left uh, circumflex artery permanent coronary occlusion, which essentially leads to a perfusion abnormality in the uh, lateral side of the heart. And then, it's, uh, and then, um, what happens is, you know, uh, we we can reconstruct the heart as per the steps we just discussed, and then track the points on the surface as they move over time. And then, uh, you know, the displacement each of those points experienced also over time, right? And so you have a displacement history in terms of phase-to-phase -phase displacement at each of these points. You can discretize it into as many points as you like. In this particular example, just to not make it too crowded, I show you a subset of the points that we plot. All right, so now, uh, you know, essentially in this small infarction, and what we're looking at on the front side is the lateral wall in this particular three-dimensional rendering, there was some hints of green in um, during the contraction phase and green during the uh, expansion phase, which was uh, hinting the presence of that infarction, which was created as a result of that uh, LCX occlusion. So essentially, we were we felt confident that you know the shape-based metric was able to identify some sort of wall motion abnormality, even though it was subtle. Uh, the region uh, up on the top, which is uh, coming up as green in both those instances of the cardiac cycle, is near the aorta. And uh, so that should be discounted. But really, looking at the mid-ventricular level down, the infarction is quite uh, clearly visible, although it was a small LCX infarction that was induced in this pig. So with that background, uh, we tried to compare, let's say, two extreme patients, a normal patient and a heart failure patient. Now, what you see over here is a, heart fa uh, is a normal patient on the right-hand side. And uh, this uh, normal patient essentially exhibited a uniform color during contraction or uniform color during expansion. So in, indicating that it was synchronously contracting and synchronously uh, dilating. Now, the heart failure patient uh, had normal basal contraction. As, uh, as you can see, it moves from red to bl blue and so on. But it had dyssynchronous apical contraction. So we were able to identify that as well. So visually, this method of um, shape-based uh, or distance-based characterization of the motion of the endocardium made sense visually. So now again, looking at the instant of diastole, uh, which is on the top line, at the specific instant of peak ejection, and specifically the instant of peak filling, you can see that you know the heart failure patient had big territories of akinesia, or not moving uh, endocardium, uh, whereas this was absent in the uh, normal reference. So essentially, Again, another um, sanity check, so to speak. But and, uh, here was the third sanity check. So essentially, uh, we were also able to identify that you know standard metrics of phase of contraction estimation from a, uh, the certain patient, let's say in this case the heart failure patient, uh, was congruent with the notion of dyssynchrony as uh, characterized by the distance metric. And so the region which was contracting against the uh, expected inward contraction during systole, uh, which is in this case the apex of the heart, was also dyssynchronous as per the phase of contraction obtained from Fourier analysis of the displacement of the heart, uh, which is a standard thing which can, which can be done from echocardiography and so on. So 
Uh, now, if you take those displacement histories, let me go back a slide again. So these blue lines that actually track the points on the endocardium over time, if you consider that displacement history over time and plot the uh, mean displacement and the standard deviation in that displacement at every instant of the cardiac cycle, all right, and then interpolate it over time to get a smooth plot, uh, you'll get something like this for a normal cohort, which in this example was from a free database uh, by Andrew Polos at all from York University, I believe. And uh, this is from heart failure patients that we knew, uh, I think 12 heart failure patients with aneurysms. And so you can see that this fingerprint of the cohort's mean uh, myocardial motion, endocardial motion, was uh, telling in terms of the expected displacement during systole, diastole, and preload. And it was uh, evident that, you know, it can probably tell you about timing in abnormalities as well in terms of when the peak uh, uh, displacement uh, over per unit time happened. The integration of this would essentially be the, vo uh, the displacement, uh, cumulative displacement it should be related to the volume over time curves, right? So now, uh, given that footing, uh, you know, comparing the MESA and determined cohorts, the MESA cohort was predominantly normal patients, asymptomatic. So uh, what we see here is the green line represents the MESA cohort, and you can see very nice crisp um, um, peaks in the systolic region, the diastolic region, and the preload regions. Whereas in the determined cohort, which was a set of patients who had disease, ischemic heart disease, this was quite different in terms of the timing of con peak contraction, slightly delayed, maybe because of the non-uniformity of contraction of the heart, right? Um, this, this synchrony, a di difference in the timing of um, diastole as well, more pronounced than that during systole. And uh, the amplitude of the displacement during diastole and systole was diminished as well. So this fingerprint of uh, ventricular contraction was quite useful to visually distinguish between these two patients patient cohorts. Now, if you went ahead and tried to extract some sort of a biomarker number from this for the purpose of a classifier, let's take the uh, patient-specific ventricular contraction curve, P to PD, time history fingerprint, and compare it with the mean of um, the MESA cohort, which we assume here is a normal cohort, right, uh, because it was asymptomatic patients, and then come up with a number of the RMS difference of uh, P to PD over, the, over time and average it out and come up with a simple number. Now, if you use that simple number, uh, you know, the, uh, ab the MESA cohort in a test, uh, uh, for, the, for the test patients were slightly, were significantly different than the determined cohort with, a, uh, uh, statistically significant, st with statistical significance. And um, so, you know, so this was interesting. And so we decided to see if, you know, how accurately uh, we were classifying patients using the rule, uh, using uh, this new metric. And uh, we pumped that into this Bayesian rule learning uh, environment, which was actually developed by my postdoctoral advisor, uh, Vanati Gopalakrishnan at University of Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. And uh, essentially, this algorithm learns a form of a Bayesian network uh, from the data. In this case, let's say le left ventricular volume, assistedly left ventricular ejection fraction, and this new metric, or any other number of metrics, and then comes up with you know what network um, satisfies uh, the probabilistic rules from the training data the best. And then we have, uh, you know, this sort of a scoring system to find out what network makes most sense. That means you'll say, okay, this index and this index, but not this index together with these thresholds tells, you, tells me the best classification results. So that's what the Bayesian rule learning uh, framework uh, told, tells us. And so if you pump that information of the RMS P2PD difference, uh, as well as the um, standard indices, you'd be able to see that the standard indices by themselves and also the RMS P2PD by itself was not very good. But when they were used together, um, they kind of boosted each other and allowed you to improve the classification of ischemic heart disease patients. Now, one thing about this phase-to-phase -phase displacement thing uh, that we've been using in order to get this RMS P2PD uh, metric um, is that the uh, phase, I mean, it, it's very ob uh, qualitatively um, objective to, uh, to interpret, as you saw from the previous slides. But when it's juiced out into a single number, um, it 
it tends to diminish in value. So we probably can extract better biomarkers. But in this example, it does boost the value of existing um, metrics. So I'm running out of time here. So I mean, the objective renderings of face-to-face -face contraction were clearly useful. And it could be useful for treatment planning, uh, selection of treatment, patients for a certain kind of treatment, or even doing virtual surgery based on uh, the, the information that you saw on wall motion. Now, the shape method obviously has its limitations because the method of just saying regional uh, distance uh, as a metric uh, from phase to phase is only applicable for co-registered shapes, which is okay for Sine cardiac MRI. But if you had something like, you know, some two blobs where the apex moved in some or orientation, you're going to miss that because, um, you know, essentially this phase-to-phase uh, -phase displacement metric does not capture uh, isometries. It's not invariant or under isometries, whereas spectral methods might be. So maybe we could improve on that with this shape-based metric. Regional timing of contraction could also be another biomarker. And, you know, essentially you could use this to compare pre- and post-operative patients uh, and, you know, a lot of different applications. This was actually done in another study we published in one of the newer journals uh, called Interactive Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery. So in regard to the biomarkers, RMS oh, asymptomatic controls, basically process a larger amount of the MESA database, perhaps, and then um, see how that affects results in terms of establishing a baseline for a simple biomarker like RMS P2PD. But maybe we'll come up with more biomarkers in future. So with that, thank uh, you all for your attention and uh, invite any questions that you have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You are finding the um, uh, root, uh, the features for applying the classification. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you also have to consider the stages of the patients that you are considering mm -hmm. for failure. There are different stages. Right, right. That will affect mm -hmm. your work motion as well as other features. Yes, yes. So the rules that you, prob you probably have for, let's say, early stage ischemic heart disease might be different for end-stage heart failure or, you know, maybe simpler for, you know, more objectively or sick patients, right? No. Yes, yes. So stratification by disease progression is important. Yes, definitely. I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you.